Welcome to the OIS Podcast. Today, we welcome Ron Yam, CEO of Novasight, a young startup that's addressing some big issues in pediatric eye care, amblyopia, more commonly known as lazy eye, and myopia. Our popular host, Dr. Rob Rothman, talks to Ron about launching a startup, how he transitioned from military optics to pediatric eye care, and about the positive study data from Novasite's latest project, CureSight. Take it away, Rob. Hello, OIS podcast audience. Uh, my name is Rob Rothman. For those of you who don't know me, I am a clinically practicing ophthalmologist. I'm a glaucoma specialist by training. Uh, I spend about half of my time uh, actively involved in patient care, both medical and surgical care of glaucoma patients. The remainder of my time uh, includes um, running uh, InFocus Capital Partners, which is an ophthalmic specialty venture capital fund. We have closed our first fund and just completed our investment period. We are now uh, fully engaged in actively supporting our 13 assets, which span the spectrum of ophthalmology from drugs, device, uh, tech, AI, uh, across all dis all disciplines in ophthalmology. And we are preparing for the not too distant launch of our second fund. Uh, one of the other activities that I get to engage in uh, on a regular basis uh, is the hosting of podcasts for OIS, which is one of my most favorite activities as I have had the opportunity over the past uh, year or year and a half to meet some incredible uh, people involved in multiple aspects uh, within the world of ophthalmology. And I am fortunate enough to be speaking with another one of those people uh, today, uh, who is Ran Yam, who is the CEO and co-founder of Novasite. And for those of you who follow the ophthalmology uh, startup world, uh, Novasite is a very exciting company that has just completed some significant work and has released some uh, exciting top line data, which we will have the opportunity to review in a, in, in a little while. Um, but uh, a company that is tackling uh, one of the most unmet needs in ophthalmology now, um, which is pediatric amblyopia, and soon to move on to something even a little bit you know, more exciting for the global population as well. So we'll get into all that. But with that, as a brief introduction, Rand, thank you for taking the time to be on the OIS podcast with me today. Thank you, Rob. Happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So, Ren, I like to, you know, you and I have had the opportunity to speak a couple of times. We've, um, we, uh, we interacted a little bit on some of the OIS Israel uh, showcase um, events in the past, and we've had some ability to speak uh, recently uh, about uh, Novasite. But I think that one of the things that's that's really interesting for the audience here, and something that appeals to a, a wide segment of the group that tends to tends to listen to these podcasts, is a little bit about you. And I think we want to focus a little bit in the beginning conversation about um, who you are, where you came from, and how you ended up, you know, starting or co-founding and eventually propagating, you know, Novasite. It's 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 there are a lot of entrepreneurs, and I think a lot of young people who are interested in entering the world of of startup uh, healthcare. And I think it's important to focus a little bit on, on your path. So if you don't mind, I think that's how we're going to start. Um, so tell us about your background. Where'd you grow up? What'd you do as a kid? Where'd you go to school? Tell us about your yeah. education, all those things. You know, who is Ran Yam? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. Happy to. Um, so as you probably understand, I'm living, born and living in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, by the way. And um, after the usual, you know, uh, Israeli uh, um, school, high school and military service, I studied mechanical engineering uh, education in the Technion. The Technion is like the MIT of Israel. And after graduation, um, actually my entire career, maybe by, uh, by chance, um, was around optics, optical system. So the first company that I was, um, Joining is called El Op, and we developed there um, the fire control systems of the Israeli tank, the Merkava. So this is like a defense industry. And then I wanted to do something else. 
which is, you know, far away from uh, military applications. And uh, then I started, I joined another startup, or for my first startup, which was in the optical communication industry. There we designed an optical switch based on a crystal, optical, um, electrical crystal that we grew ourselves and uh, written holograms in six dimensions into this crystal. Later on, uh, another industry, semiconductors, where we designed a wafer inspection machine with high-end optics to, uh, you know, to locate very small defects in the wafer. And then for the last 10 years, I've been VP of R&D for a company called Visionix, uh, which is dealing with eye diagnostics. And when I joined the company, it was actually a very small break-even company dealing with lens inspection, wanted to move into the medical side. And I was fortunate to be there at this point and help the company to grow up from this uh, small break-even uh, status into the global leading corporate it is today. So this was my background, and uh, then I can tell you a little bit about how Novasite started. Yeah, that's great. So uh, when I was uh, leading the R&D of VisionX, I was introduced by a mutual friend to a very nice uh, retired guy that had an idea, and he was actually looking for money. He was looking for investment. And his idea was uh, because of something that happened to one of his friends that went uh, through a stroke. And you know, when you have a stroke, sometimes uh, half of your body gets paralyzed. And when it happens to the muscles of the eyes, then you get, you have strabismus. The two eyes are not aligned anymore. And the only thing that you can do with adult strabismus of this type is to just put a patch and, and just cancel the eye. And he came up with an idea of using a uh, VR headset to be worn over the, over the head and take a photo of the scenery and using eye tracking, and this is the first time I heard about the eye tracking technology, using eye tracking in order to show this deviating eye, the scenery that it would have seen if it was looking straight. So he had this idea and he built a small lab prototype and he was looking for more money and he came to me. Then I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And then we hook up, he hooked up to another uh, professor of pharmacology in Israel, which is quite well known, Professor Michael Belkin. And we sat at his office, the three of us, and he said, guys, you know, eye tracking, you can do so many things without, with it, uh, many more than just helping adults with strabismus. We can help pediatrics, uh, you can, we can do a treatment, we can do diagnostics, we can do so, so much. And then I said, okay, this is an opportunity that I was waiting, waiting for to start my own company. Then I jumped in, uh, took the role of the CEO, and this was almost seven years ago. This is how we started. So let's let me go backwards a little bit. So you're an engineer by by training, and you've propagated yourself through the world of tank firing systems to high tech optics, and and then ultimately, if, you know, I can I can make the leap between you know high you know highly functioning optics into ophthalmology. That sort of makes sense. But right. what was the impetus? I mean, how did you decide to leave a you know, technology, military, and end up in life sciences? Like, what was, what was that? I think that's the step that very often seems very obvious to you, but is very difficult to sort of verbalize when you're trying to explain to people how to get, you know, how to get into the world of life sciences. So what was that, right. you know, decision making? So I think the thread was optics. I must say that, uh, you know, um, Going into the optical world was a bit of a chance for me. So it was just an opening, my first company. And, you know, when talking to young, uh, young graduates, I always tell them, you know, be very, very careful the first position that you take or the first company that you choose. Because if you choose wrongly, then this could, you know, uh, uh, direct, direct you through the, the rest of your uh, path. So it's really important to, even if it's a very small position, but uh, something that you can, you can grow out of, I think it's very, very important to choose the right uh, company to begin with. And it was a very, very interesting company with a very, uh, I would say, sophisticated optical systems. And so this was the, and, and then I had the chance to, to learn from, you know, from very professional people about mechanical engineering, optical engineering, electrical engineering, and all, all that. And then it was like very naturally progressing from optical system to another optical system to another optical system. And the end, the eyes, the eyes are optical systems, right? And um, 
when uh, when the opportunity came, I was very, very happy uh, to move to the medical side because this is something I really wanted to do. I wanted to be involved, you know, in making humanity a little bit better. And even though you can do it with communication, you can do it with uh, wafer inspection and, and electronics, I think the most direct way to do that is with healthcare. So I was really um, excited to move to the, uh, to the healthcare side. This is something I wanted to do. Right. So, so I, I, it's, that's great. Thank you for explaining. I think that's the right thing. I think there was peripheral involvement in optical, optical systems and then moves on, you know, to the eye. It makes perfect sense. We are excited to announce that applications are now being accepted to present at the next Retina Innovation Summit being held on July 13th in New York City before the American Society of Retina Specialists. Visit OISRetina.com to submit your application before June 1st. There is no better event to showcase your innovation in front of corporate, clinical, and capital leaders than at OIS. Michael Belkin's a name that's well known to, to most of us in the investment community. Obviously, Belkin Laser is doing very well. He's involved in Novasight, which is doing very well. He seems to have um, a unique skill set for identifying good technology that can then be propagated into um, commercial, commercially successful businesses. How did you end up getting involved with Michael? How was he involved with this person who had the idea about the tracking for amblyopia? I mean, yeah. for your business, how, how did that all occur? So Danny O is the, the original founder of the company, which I just described before. He, uh, he was looking for, uh, you know, he is a really bright engineer as well, also from the Technium, by the way. And, but had no no uh, no experience in healthcare at all. So he was looking for someone that can help him with the design of the, the specific system that he thought about. So he was moving from a pharmacist to a pharmacist, and uh, as he said, and I didn't know him at this time, he said nobody could even understand what he's trying to do. And then he came across uh, another professor in Chiba in the hospital, and he he actually was a plastician. Uh, but he knew Professor Belkin. He said, I know the guy for you. I know the best guy for you. And then he came into the uh, uh, Professor Belkin's office and Danny always said, it took him about five minutes to say, you have a great thing there. This was just five minutes of his time. He said, come on, Danny, you have a great thing. You can do so many things with it. We should, we should uh, take it on. And a little bit later than that, I also joined. And then, you know, I'm bringing the experience from the industry uh, Professor Belkin was uh, giving his ophthalmology expertise and Danny with the uh, innovation. And this was a winning team. And then we, 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 need to raise, we needed to raise money. This is, was the first uh, time for me because I was always on the R&D uh, side, engineering, and then moving to the business side. This was a, a bit of a step, a bit of a leap. Uh, so I had to learn you know, the business side, but it was fairly straightforward for me and I had some very good friends that made the first investment and you know later on I knew how to do it <laughs> I learned how to do it it's it's funny I think and you know you you and I have had this conversation before as well that I think there's a unique environment in Israel that allows for these sort of quick interactions to occur between people people the not only the the level of scientific uh, capability inside of Israel but the relatively close proximity of people to each other. You know, you can have, uh, you know, researchers sitting next to clinicians, you know, sitting next to funding sources in very close proximity, and you all sort of are very well aware of each other. And, and the collaborative environment in which you work allows for this sort of more rapid interaction, I think, that helps to move projects along a little bit more quickly than they may in areas, you know, the people who you think you need to bring in to make your team complete. Whereas in Israel, it's very compact and people seem to congregate around these technology centers, you know, whether it's Technion or any of the other centers in Israel, where, where a lot of the, you know, science and, and research and, you know, you have engineering next to, next to biotech and, and everything sort of, sort of on top of each other. And I think that that's actually an advantage. I agree. I agree. Uh, there's a saying in Israel that anyone here is not more than two phone calls away. So... Anyone that you want to achieve in Israel, it would take another person in between, and then you can you can get to him because it's a very, yeah. as you said, 
very compact country and the, very, the networking is very, very tight. Uh, as an example, we have, uh, you mentioned the uh, Belkin Laser. So Belkin Laser and another, other maybe 40 startups in ophthalmology, we have a very lively uh, WhatsApp group, which is very, very uh, active and people, you know, collaborate, help each other. And yeah, it works very well. Right. And we listen, we as an investor, you know, we've interacted with a lot of Israeli companies, you know, uh, Tarsier and Daphne, they're doing fantastically sure. well on the pharma mm -hmm. side. And, and there's a bunch of companies. And, and, and I think, you know, just a, a, as an aside, you know, we are, are developing a, a, a close collaboration with BioLite, who I think is critical mm -hmm. to the success of ophthalmology in Israel uh, as a publicly funded venture vehicle for ophthalmic development, which is a fantastic model. And we hope to have a, you know, a much more formal interaction with BioLite um, in in our second fund, you know, that we plan on launching, hopefully within the next uh, six months or so. But, um, you know, I think that it's a unique environment and it, the success so far of Novaside, I think is, is something that can be partially attributed to the environment in which the company has grown. I think it helps significantly with the, the time it takes um, to propagate technology is, is shortened to some degree. And, and I think we have some evidence in our diligence that supports that. Uh, and I think that it's going to make Israel a, a continued uh, target for investment dollars um, for company for at least investors who think that um, they would like to see some maybe a little bit more quick quick return on their venture capital dollars. So um, you know I you know it's just a, a position that we've taken it in focus and, and I think it is real and being recognized by others as well. So let's get into Novasite now. So you 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 have this background. You've met the right people. You have started this company. Tell me how you you propagate this. Where does it go, and what did you decide were going to be your targets um, for development? Because you have a couple um, that are are very exciting, and I, and I think that um, there's obviously been some progression that maybe you could walk us through. Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, maybe chronologically, I can say that you know every company has its own evolution. So we started, if you remember, from adults and from. Strabismus, and then uh, we thought that we split the company into two areas. One would be low vision, the other would be kids, pediat uh, pediatrics. It took us about one year to understand that low vision is a very tough market, tough in many aspects. And so we decided to focus only on pediatrics. So starting from second year of the company, we only dealt with uh, areas that are um, connected to pediatrics. And I think this is something very, very unique to the company, the focus on pediatrics, but not the focus on one product. So we think, oh, oh we pride ourselves as be, uh, building an ecosystem of solutions. So we're targeting three different segments. One is diagnostics, second is treatment, and the third and, and new one is prevention. And I can share with you a little bit about what we're doing in each segment. So on the diagnostic side, we have a device uh, already in the market called uh, uh, iSwift. This is a vision assessment device that is running 11 different vision tests today, being distributed by Essilor Luxotica uh, globally, uh, mainly in Europe so far. And um, this uh, device is using, um, again, eye tracking. Everything that we do is, maybe it's, it's, it's a good uh, point in time that I will explain a little bit what eye tracking is. Sure. So um, we're using a sensor, an infrared sensor that is tracking the position and gaze direction of the eyes about 90 times per second. So it's very, very fast. And it produces an objective information. You, you don't need to ask anything. We just follow the eyes mm -hmm. and also very accurate. So we, we use it for treatment. We use it for diagnostics. This gives us both the uh, position of the eyes, but also the attention of a person. So whenever you're looking at something, this is your attention. So, um, so this is done uh, in almost all of our products. So, so I'm starting to say about diagnostics. So the iSwift is currently on the market and currently we are in transition from the first generation device to a second generation device that uh, in terms of regulation in Europe is moving from a class one a device to a class two A uh, device under the MDR uh, regulation in Europe. And, and the second generation device is also a little bit uh, different in philosophy, it is running protocols. So not unitary tests, but protocols, for instance, a myopia monitoring protocol or a myopia monitoring protocol or 
binocular vision, and it is targeting both the uh, retail, so uh, op optical shops, but also clinicians such as ophthalmologists and optometrists. So this is the diagnostic side. On the treatment side, we are very excited to finish uh, currently to complete the first pivotal study of our CureSight lazy eye treatment device uh, successfully. Uh, so this device is replacing the ancient uh, patching treatment. I think it's 200 years old. Hmm. Old standard treatment for lazy eye. If you saw some kids running around with a patch over their eye, it's unbelievable that in 21st century, this is still the solution for lazy eye. And we came up with a device that uh, its concept is that the kid is wearing blue red glasses and watching his favorite content from the device could be anything. So imagine Netflix, YouTube, uh, educational content, whatever the kid wants to see. And what we are doing at the background is first, of course, we track the position of the eyes and then we change the content. We do real time image uh, processing according to the momentary gaze position and only on the center of vision with a strong eye, we blur the content. And this way we stimulate the brain to start working with the amblyopic eye because it has to complete the fine details from the amblyopic eye that we blur on the center of vision with a strong eye. But also because we balance the images, we allow the brain to start building a 3D perception, combine the two images and build binocular vision and 3D perception. So we ran a, a pivotal study, a randomized control study, um, including about 100 kids. Um, and uh, it was a non-inferiority study and we met our primary endpoint. So we just released the top line data. Uh, we met our primary endpoint. This is the first ever study that showed the efficacy of a digital device against the gold standard patching. Not only that we met our primary endpoint, we uh, also found better results of visual acuity improvement in the treatment than the patch. Also significant stereo acuity improvement was uh, found on both groups. Uh, so we are very, very encouraged from the results and we're not in preparation for the submission of our um, FDA uh, 510K clearance. Okay, so let me stop you for a second. So that's a lot of information right there, right? So for anybody who understands um, the current treatment protocol for uh, amblyopia or lazy eye um, knows that kids have to wear patches for a certain number of hours per day. And it is incredibly challenging to achieve compliant usage because kids don't like to have their better seeing eye completely occluded. Uh, so compliance is incredibly poor. And I'm not a pediatric ophthalmologist, but I've lived through residency and, and I've, and, you know, I see people who have, um, you know, amblyopia every day, uh, you know, developed it in childhood. Uh, and it persists today. So you know, patching is is horrible, and and most people just just don't do well with it. Um, and one of the risks of patching, which is that you're going to actually damage the better eye. So right, you put a patch over the better eye, the better eye doesn't see anything, and if the patching isn't done correctly, you can actually cause a decrease in vision in the better eye. Right. So this is one of the big problems is that um, you're you're exposing the child to risk with with improper therapy, not only because one eye doesn't develop, but the other eye may get, the good eye may get worse. So you basically track eye movements and blur the central vision in the better eye, but not create a deprivational environment for that eye. Exactly. So did you see any decrease in acuity in the treat in the better eye no. in your group? No, no. no we, had, we had nothing. Um, also adherence was amazing. 93% of the prescribed time, which is 90 minutes per day, five times a week. Um, satisfaction was at 95%. So, Wait, really, so that's it? Nin it's 90 minutes, five times a week. That's it. Correct. So you're correct. saying you can give a kid an iPad. They can watch whatever content they watch under your, with, with your program in place, and they will be treated for their amblyopia while they watch that. Yeah, so maybe in principle, yes, but maybe I can elaborate a little bit because it's not sure. just an iPad. You really need to get our device. And the way that it would work in the US is that we actually secured already three CPT codes for our treatment, which are unique to the technology. And the way that it would work is that any physician that would like to start prescribing the uh, cure site would get a demo device that uh, would be used to demo the technology to the parents. Once they want to get on board, he would just key in in our uh, web portal, the, both the logistic data and the clinical data. This would be received by our monitoring center, which is already active in the US. 
And this monitoring center would do a few things. First, benefit investigation to make sure that the patient is covered. Then it would ship the device directly to the home of the patient. And then it would track remotely both any technical issue, but also the compliance. So if there's any issue of compliance, monitoring center is there to help. So a totally hassle-free experience for the physician. Great. And the staff, the staff of the uh, of the clinic, the only thing that they have to do is to uh, uh, monitor uh, monthly uh, an automated generated report, and for that they are getting also uh, reimbursed for their time. So it's also a, re a revenue stream for the clinic. So all that business model is in place, and uh, we are now waiting for the FDA clearance. We're already working with the insurance company uh, to uh, you know to receive coverage for those the CPT codes. And hopefully when once launched to, into the market, uh, a little bit later, uh, it would be a free uh, experience for the parents and families. How much, how much uh, follow-up is required by the patient in the office? Meaning, so somebody has to monitor the, the clinical improvement, the acuity improvement. You can certainly do that on your device, I would imagine, but, or maybe not, but ultimately, the patients still have to go to the doctor and, and is it the physician who ultimately decides when the treatment can be completed or how does it work? Yeah, good question. So first of all, it's really uh, nice to understand how, how compliance monitoring works. Remember that we have an eye tracker. So uh, compliance is only calculated when both eyes are on screen. So just even, the, and we're talking about very young kids, like four years old, they could be at, uh, alone in the house, you know, watching their favorite content. But let's say that the kid, instead of watching the screen, is now playing with his cell phone. We know it. Now we know that because the eyes are not on screen and it does not count on, on, uh, as compliance. And compliance is being generated and being recorded all the time on the cloud. And if there is a compliance issue, there is an alert to the monitoring center. Monitoring center would have an escalation process of first uh, sending an email and, if necessary, uh, even uh, giving a call to the family. So on the staff, on the clinic side, it's totally transparent. They don't need to deal with anything except for monitoring the report once a month. Once the kid is coming back to be examined at the clinic, uh, would it be once a month or two months? Uh, and the visual acuity hopefully is now improving. They are keying in the new visual acuity. The device is picking up the new visual acuity from the cloud automatically and adjusts the treatment. So as visual acuity improves, the amount of blur and the size of blur is reduced in order to come as much as possible towards normal viewing. So all that is happening automatically. Automatically. That's fantastic. So the, so, so the program is doing a lot of the assessment for the physician. Right. Uh, we're very careful not to assess visual, even though we can, of course, with the technology, right. we're not assessing visual acuity by our Cuba, own. Right. We are letting the physician decide on visual acuity, only picking it up from the cloud and adjusting the treatment accordingly. Right. Fantastic. And at the end of treatment, let's say success is achieved, the family ships the device back to you and, and they're done. Right. That's it. So uh, once the uh, physician is king in end of treatment, which uh, we assume to be between four to six months, then automatically this would generate a recovery process and the device would be picked up from the family and you know, processed to the uh, next customer. Yeah, by the way, they, the glasses themselves that are used uh, for the, the it's their plastic uh, simple uh, glasses, they are discarded and no need to return them, only the device is being returned. I, I think that we may see the end of patching. I mean, I think that's obvious. We, this is our target. This this is our seems target. like, why would you want to patch your kid if you could do this instead, right? I mean, this, uh, I mean I've mean, i heard horror stories, you know, from parents <laughs> and their kids with patching. Yeah, I mean, I'm you sure know, you, you, know, you hear them too. So, sometimes you hear that the treatment is much worse than the, <laughs> you know, than the indication. So sometimes the kids are left with uh, such a psychological issues with a period that they're wearing the patches and being harassed by other kids. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, this is be becoming worse than the, than the lazy eye itself. Unbelievable. So, so yes. you have positive, then you have positive top line data. You're going to be releasing, I'm sure, your, your fully scrubbed data eventually. And, and the FDA submission process is ongoing at the moment? So we are about to submit in a, between three to four weeks. We are now in the process of statistical analysis and preparing the submission. So we uh, plan to submit between three to four weeks from today, and we hopefully uh, get the FDA clearance around Q3, September of this year. 
and immediately launch it. We already have a group of early adopters, physicians that would like to work with us. So um, we're on track. Yeah, fantastic. Now, the technology lends itself to significantly uh, to a lot of other applications. So there are a lot of other things that, that I'm sure, based on what I know of your technology, uh, might benefit from this. So, you know, we go in, in ophthalmology, we go through these cycles where there are sudden sort of periods of attention focused on um, different disease states. And amblyopia therapy is not one of them, right? You guys have great technology that will solve it, but I don't think there were hundreds of companies out there looking to solve the problem of uh, replacement therapy for patching, and that will benefit you greatly. But there is a lot of um, activity around myopia prevention, right? right? So myopia prevention is, is becoming somewhat of a epidemic um, globally, uh, especially in Asia and countries where this is a huge problem because most people think of just wearing near, you know, wearing glasses and being nearsighted, but it's much more than that. You know, significant myopia leads to ocular health issues. Um, you know, that can be, um, you know, severe and vision threatening, you know, as time goes on. So how does your technology lend itself to that? And what are your plans for potentially addressing uh, myopia prevention as a as a non-pharmacologic or non-surgical solution. Yeah, so this is really exciting. So just a very quick overview of how uh, myopia is being dealt today. So either with a drug, usually low-dose atropine, or with an optical correction, which is split into contact lenses, mainly ortho lenses, but now there's also other lenses, contact lenses, mainly from Cooper Vision. And then very uh, recently emerging solutions of spectacles. Uh, there are now, I think there are designs from Zeiss, from Hoya, from Essilor. Now, um, the interesting thing about it that all the optical correction uh, um, solutions uh, are focusing on a perif peripheral blur. So there's a small central uh, area which is sharp, no, with no degradation of vision. And then on the periphery, uh, there are elements that degrade vision. So think about, you know, spectacles with this degraded pattern. And now think about a kid. Could be a small kid that is running around, moving his eyes. What happens when he's moving his eyes, you know, back and forth? He's now starting to see through the degraded area of the lens and, and suffering from degraded vision. And this, this area, the center is relatively small. So then we thought, why not doing that on the screen? So take the uh, Bliopia solution that we have, which is real-time image processing according to the momentary gaze position, and now do the peripheral blur on the screen itself. So, um, and in this case, because we have an eye tracker, because we know exactly where the eyes are looking at, we can actually make this central uh, clear area smaller than on the glasses because we don't need to accommodate you know, the eye movements, the, 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 the pattern is moving with the eyes. And we believe that by reducing the size of the clear area, the, uh, the efficacy of the solution would be higher. And when you're thinking about it, it's actually targeting the source or one of the major sources of myopia because myopia, the, the, the surge of myopia in the 21st century is... Uh, mainly thought uh, to be uh, uh, connected to the modern way of life, meaning not enough hours of sunshine outside the house and also a lot of uh, um, close up work, especially with screens. So take this thing that is actually causing myopia and reduce its negative effect by having uh, a real time peripheral blare done all the time. So the kid is getting a screen that is myopia safe and using it for everything that he's doing, starting with homework, uh, entertainment, whatever he's doing, he would do, uh, he would use this screen, this myopia safe screen. And we need to prove of course, but it makes a lot of sense that having this digital treatment would work. And this digital treatment is not, it doesn't have to be a standalone treatment. You can also combine it with any other treatment. So whatever it's the drug, uh, contact lens or spectacles, now you have another layer of, uh, of digital treatment that is working at the most critical times when the kid is actually watching screen. So, um, so this is already working at our, at our lab. We have a POC that, uh, that you can use and it's almost unnoticeable because the, uh, the clear area is, is moving with your vision and you cannot even feel it almost. 
Uh, and then um, it's not only a peripheral blare, but we also added a, a distance warning. So if the kid is coming too close to the screen, the eye tracker would warn, move back, you're too close. Because again, coming close to the screen would induce more myopia. More myopia, right. That's so this fantastic. is something we are now developing. We are, we've written a patent over it. Uh, the company has a large portfolio of patents. Uh, we have already 17 granted patents, 14, uh, you know, ongoing patents. And this is a, a additional patent that we applied for. And uh, now we're working with consumer electronics giants in order to, uh, to take this idea and bring it into, into life. So that's great. So you're, so you have, you know, one product that's uh, already uh, generating revenue and being sold. You have one that's um, about to be hopefully FDA approved within the next six months that's geared up and ready to go. And you have one product that's currently in development and teed up to start propagating forward. So you've got this nice sort of succession yeah. of, of technology that's, um, you know, sort of uh, caravanning onto each other, which, which, which is great to see. It's great technology. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's nice to know that there are, um, you know, non-pharmacologic options out there that um, will hopefully have a significant impact on preventing myopia. Um, and it sounds like you're going to continue to have um, success based on the success of your technology and its fundamental form for amblyopia. So um, I, I love that approach of having a platform that you can expand on in, in, multiple, in, in multiple different ways. So you're raising money. Is that correct? You're going right. to raise money. Yeah, so um, so far the company raised 20 million from inception, and now we are raising a similar amount, so between 15 to 20 million as a round B of the company. Uh, the main use of proceeds is first for the commercialization of the Cure site in the US. So we we'll take some work and uh, build a sales force in the US. We will start with direct sales. Maybe later on uh, we will scale up uh, with indirect distribution, but currently. As a first approach, uh, we will, um, uh, you know, have our own sales force in, in the U.S. We already initiated a subsidiary. By the way, we do have also a subsidiary in China, and we are currently running uh, trials, uh, supplementary studies in the U.S. and China of the CureSight Lazy Eye Treatment Device. And um, so, yes, we are raising uh, between 15 to 20 million. Um, the valuation is not set yet. We're happy to discuss it with the uh, with uh, potential uh, investors and uh, yeah, happy to and, um, to talk about and it. Some of, and some of that funding will obviously go towards the development of myopia treatment. Correct. So uh, development of myopia treatment, second generation of uh, diagnostic device. Yeah, sure. There are a lot of uh, a lot of uh, avenues that need money. Um, so yes, that's fantastic. Look, I I am um, you know I've been following your company for quite some time. You know, really. It's 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 great to see that you guys have progressed over the years that 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 we've been around and um, that you now have a completed clinical trial with positive top line data and um, you know for a previously unmet unmet need is, is is really great and I'm really excited to see you know how the myopia therapy moves forward and I think you've done a fantastic job of 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 using a, a unique blend of you know optical engineering eye tracking. Um, and ophthalmic knowledge to build products that are going to, you know, replace 200 year old patching, you know, uh, which is it's just, it's amazing. It's taken this long. I seem to have this conversation with a lot of the people who, who have these interviews, which is, I don't understand why it's taken so long for us to tackle some of these problems. But, um, you know, when, when I think when investors look at ophthalmology and they comment that, you know, they don't understand why so much attention is being turned to ophthalmology and why such a small little organ deserves so much funding until you start to realize <laughs> how many issues there are, how many unmet needs there are in ophthalmology. Um, it, it's really fascinating. So um, I think we're going we're gonna to sort of wind it down here, Rand, just because of, of timing. But you know, I have to say, I think Novasite's an exciting company. I think you guys have done a fantastic job of moving forward. I think everybody is looking forward to seeing um, uh, the commercial release in a large scale of the Ampiopi therapy. I think it's our It'll make everybody smile a little bit when we fail to see patches down the road. Um, and certainly, I hope I hope you'll come back at some point when you've got um, when you've got some more progress on the myopia therapy because I know people listening here are going to want to hear about that. So, um, you know, thanks for your time today. Congratulations on your success. 
And uh, looking forward to the next time we have a discussion where we'll be talking about uh, myopia prevention in greater detail. Thank you very much, Rob. It was a real pleasure. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for listening to OIS Podcast. Thank you for listening, everyone. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the OIS Podcast. Be sure to listen in next week as we discuss the latest innovations in ophthalmology with experts in science, medicine, and industry. Subscribe to our iTunes channel so you don't miss a thing. Got a story of your own to tell? Apply to be a guest at ois.net.